Today might be the last day of actually covering stuff. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the rest of the time we'll be dealing with uh, either homework or the uh, oral final. Okay. So the last part of chapter, or last parts of uh, chapter four, um, two other types of methods. So all, we're still all about the A X equals B, or A U equals F, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so we need to talk about multigrid methods, which will feature prominently in the last homework problem. Um, okay, and um, I, I have to admit that um, the idea behind multigrid, it's a pretty genius idea. And I don't say that very often about certain ideas in numerical analysis, because a lot of them are just kind of predictable, but there are certain ones that's like, wow, that's, that's nice. Um, so hopefully I can uh, convey that to you. Um, so, so again, for uh, Poisson's equation, minus the plus mu is equal to f, that is discretized into some linear system that we're going to solve. Dang it. Um, and as I brought up last time, uh, how this can be solved by an iterative method. Um, they're called stationary iterative methods. All have this form. Um, P D is equal to um, R, where um, okay. Sorry, I need to. I made a mistake of not bringing enough pages in here. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I feel like something's missing here, but okay, where P is whatever preconditioner you have chosen. Um, for your system to make it closer to identity. Um, D is just the difference between successive iterates. So the, the idea is once you find D, you know, I'll put a subscript K here. Once you find DK, you add it onto XK and you get XK plus one. And R, which will also give a subscript K, is your residual. My notation is a little messed up. So the path of minimum fix is to change the notation of that. Um, so residual is given by this. So, so any stationary method can be written um, in this form. So we, once we have xk, we get the residual. We solve this system, and then the solution to that we add on to our previous iterate to get our next iterate. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is uh, focus on the behavior of various um, uh, preconditioners. Okay, now. Um, I mentioned some preconditioners last time, but I'm going to throw in um, a couple more. Okay, so we have um, 
P equals uh, D, which is the um, So remember, A is split into these three parts, diagonal plus lower triangle plus upper triangle. So if I set the preconditioner just equal to the diagonal part, which makes this system very easy to solve, um, that is the Jacobi method. Um, and one other method, which I'll also I'll number one star, because it's so closely related. I didn't mention this one before. P is equal to three has D. That is called weighted Jacobi. Um, okay. And then um, another option is uh, Gauss Seidel P is equal to D plus L. Um, so at least the system you're solving over here during each iteration is a lower triangular system. Lower triangular system can be solved by what method? Yeah, lower triangular can be solved. In other words, you don't have to go for the whole Gauss elimination ring or all. You can jump directly to what instead? Well, the lower triangular matrix <coughs> would be the L. So you're, back substitution. you're so close. Forward, Forward substitution. substitution. Yes. Back substitution is for upper triangular uh, systems. Okay. Um, and then there's also SLR, which I won't really bother with uh, today. I mentioned that um, earlier. Now, um, so there's one nice property of these kind of preconditioners. Um, are very good at eliminating high frequency error. Um, and so another way of putting that is that the residual RK gets smoother. As k increases. All right. Um, so, so any vector, you know, your your your, ve your vector x k. If you, what you can always do, is you can take a Fourier transform of it, um, and the Fourier transform would show you what are the high and low frequency components of that vector x. Um, and what you would find if you did that, like take the Fourier transform of this residual, you would find that the high frequency components of RK would be um, getting smaller much more rapidly. In other words, that part of the error corresponding to high frequencies is going to zero pretty quickly. But low frequency error is sticking around. So unfortunately, these preconditions are not so good um, for the low frequency part. But the fact that they do eliminate high frequency error, um, and that is why, if you ever go, if you ever attend someone's talk about multigrid, how they will refer to these preconditioners. You might not call them preconditioners. Um, you might call this a smoother, because that's what really what it's doing. It's, it's making the error smoother. Because you're trying to drive an error to zero, 
and you're not getting, and that will happen very slowly. As far as wiping out the error completely, uh, these methods are not fast at doing that. But if they're at least getting rid of part of the error fast, bless you, which these do, then that's something we can use. Um, okay. Um, Another term that's thrown out in multi good circles. So, for preconditioning, so when a multi grid person talks about relaxation, um, in the colloquial sense, something we could always uh, definitely use, um, but in a mathematical sense, it's about this applying this preconditioner uh, to try to make the error smoother. So that's called like a relaxation step. Um, and this just goes to show that what I found from dabbling in several areas of mathematics, and while spending most of my time in numerical analysis, but looking at certain niches like multigrid within numerical analysis or elsewhere, like when I pretended to be a data analyst for a few years just to make money, um, is that people in these different areas love to develop their own jargon for things that are already well established. And, uh, um, like, um, and I, was, I was poking fun at the various data analysis terms too, like you know, machine learning, deep learning. It makes it sound so sci fi. It's not. This stuff has been around for, set for decades, if not longer. It's like, shut up. <laughs> and, um, and it seems like that's really half a battle when you're trying to learn a new area, which a lot of us are often under pressure to do to try to keep pace with what is the hot area of mathematics these days. Like now, it's, it's, it's statistics, it's data analysis. Ten years ago, it was computational biology. And I was told by people, because I was job hunting at that time, great idea to be job hunting during recession, but I didn't have a choice in the matter. Um, and, and, they, and they said, well, you should steer your work towards computational biology because then they don't want to hire you. I'm like, no, I, I'm not, that's not what I do. So um, I probably shouldn't have been so stubborn, but it all worked. Um, but that's a challenge that the, like you, you're, you find yourself, if you're the, the, um, getting into a new area, trying to learn something about it, and you really need an interpreter or become your own interpreter because you're going to talk about these terms, you have no idea what they are, and then if you, when you finally dig into it and see what they really are, it's like, oh, I know what that is. I know it by this. And like, it's, I don't know. Um, people want to take what they're doing and make it sound new, um, just to make it more interesting. It's like, well, why don't you just develop more sophisticated things um, that no one has ever seen? But you can call it whatever you want. Um, so, I don't know. <clears throat> I realize I've spent more time on the soapbox in this class, but... <laughs> okay. But I hope get, you guys learned something valuable from that, too. Um, okay. So, how can we... So, so, this observation about what the error looks like is essential because it can be exploited. Um, so this is the most important thing I'll write about multigrid, right here. Because the residual is smoother, it can be represented on a coarser grid. Um, now, uh, I'm going to try to draw for you um, what that means.
students who are not having every kind of crisis imaginable now. Oh, uh, yeah. So, well, me for 102, so it's all the same. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's suppose I have a grid on which I'm representing a function. Let's suppose that grid has a lot of points. So a capital N in the homework, very large. Okay. Um, so as let's suppose I have a function that is pretty smooth. So I'll go ahead and plot every point, as tedious as it is. Um, and just play connect the dots. Okay. All right, so there's my smooth function. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to circle every other point. Um, and now, I'm going to ignore all the uncircled points and play connect the dots again. Um, and I wish I had colored shot for this, but... All right, I'll... Okay. So if I just... I have to do that every class. Nothing really changed because it's a smooth function. Um, so it's something where I could delete half the grid points and, can, and reconstruct a function from the half that are remaining and still essentially have the same function. Uh, so this is a smooth case. So by contrast, Um, all right, so again, I want lots of points, and I'll have these function values jump all over the place. Have some high frequency content here, something pretty oscillatory. Oh, this is hard to draw for some reason. So then, once again, I'll connect the box. Okay. Now, I'll do the same thing. Circle every other point. And play connect the box again. It's a little bit off. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so that's what I mean between you know, um, functions that can and cannot be represented on a coarser grid than what you have. In fact, this one, I probably could have cut it down even further and still had a pretty good representation. So that is the key idea behind multigrid. That you have your residual, and it's been smoothed because of the use of whatever preconditioner you have. So now what you can do is, those steps I described, like you make a residual and then you solve that system and then you update your solution, you carry that out on a coarser grid. Why does that help? To carry, so to continue this process on a grid with fewer points. Why is that helpful if you still have to go for that computation anyway? Storing? Well, okay, yes, you're storing less. That's one. What else? What, what, what else can we gain by carrying it out on a grid of fewer points? A smaller matrix. 
Well, it would be a smaller matrix, but so, um, what? Yes, computational efficiency. We're performing fewer arithmetic operations. Um, so for something like this, we're dealing with sparse matrix, like for Poisson's equation, you're cutting a time in half. So, and what, and, uh, so what you can do is, you go ahead and solve that half-sized problem, and then when you compute the residual the next time, it's smoother still. So you can do it again, and you keep cutting the grid in half until the problem is so small, you might as well just solve it directly. Like maybe it's down to like, you know, just ten or so equations or something, something simple like that. Um, and then what you can do is now that you solve the problem on the core fine grid, which so you interpolate. Um, so that, that's the idea behind multigrid. And it only works because of this, because that residual is smooth. Um, and I can also point out from other things I've observed, whether it deals with my own work or somebody else's work, that anytime you have these, you, there's so many situations where you can realize some enormous gains in efficiency just by making one observation about the behavior of your data. Um, so in this case, it's, it's about the, um, uh, it's, 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 it's about the smooth residual. Um, in, in my own work, in my, in my KSS methods, there's one observation that I made about um, behavior of various things I deal with that explains why they work as well as they do. Um, and that's how innovation is driven. But even when you have something that's working, if you understand the behavior of what it is, you can make it so much better. Um, and uh, like leaps and bounds better than it was before. Um, so, so now that we have the key idea behind multigrid and why it's actually feasible, um, uh, well, I should mention. Um, our former PhD student, Haley Dozier, um, her dissertation, um, or her master's thesis and doctoral dissertation, were about using multigrid type ideas with my Creole cell space spectral methods. And there, the same observation held up that um, we were solving time dependent PDEs, but in that case also, we had a residual that just had to be defined differently for a time dependent PDE. And we observed that the same thing held, that the residual is smooth, and so I thought, oh, well, then this multigrid idea should work there also, and it did. Um, so, um, so a lot of times these ideas that were designed for certain linear systems, like for Poisson's equation, can be applied elsewhere, you, once you have the right ways to define everything. So, so that you can do the one multigrid problem in the homework, um, I need to talk about how would the actual algorithm go? Because the way it's coded, um, like the class last time, two years ago, kind of threw people off. <clears throat> and I don't want you all to suffer as much. <clears throat> there will still be suffering, but hopefully not as much. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Um, now, so the way multigrid algorithm works is um, First of all, I'll try the system that we're solving because I need to establish some notation. A H U is equal to B H. Now the subscript H H indicates a grid spacing like we've seen elsewhere. But I'm using it as a subscript so that because we're going to be working on different grids, thus multi-grid. Um, and we have to have ways to go from one grid to another. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing that's done 
is this moving step. So we solve um, system okay. um, Okay. So, um, so we're solving a system to get an approximate solution. So this is like a first, um, a, a, a first approximation of a solution. Um, and supposedly this has um, this has error that has been smoothed out. All right. So, what this could entail? As an example, like we can use the Gauss-Seidel iteration. And you don't have to do this one iteration. You can form several iterations if you like. Like maybe you're trying to get the error under some tolerance, but you're not trying to go all the way to high accuracy. You just want to go part way enough to get the high frequency error reduced, you may still have some significant error, but if it's low frequency, that's okay. Um, so like in the homework, this is what you would do. You use Gauss-Seidel um, uh, for a certain number of iterations. So now you have this approximate solution, UH. So now what you need is a residual So we'll call that RH, and that's equal to BH minus AH UH. Okay, just straight definition of residual. Okay. Um, then, so here's the first actual multi gridish um, step. Okay. Um, You restrict RH to a coarser grid. So that means that, um, so you start with RH, and I'm going to define a um, matrix R. Okay. Now, the subscript H will be the spacing for a grid you start on. The superscript will be the spacing of a grid you end up at. So we're going to a grid with twice the spacing. So it's coarser by, by half. Um, so this is a straight matrix vector multiplication. So in the homework, you're actually going to make this matrix. And I'll tell you how to do that, just not yet. And the output of that is a residual on the coarser grid. So what that means is this vector is about half the length of this one because it's defined using half as many points. <clears throat> All right, so this one of those, this is multi-grid jargon. We need a restriction operator. It's averaging. Um, so, and I want to see if I have that in the hints. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I have here restriction operator and the opposite of that, the interpolation operator, are defined in the MIT notes and also in the video for a June 29 class about 15 minutes in. Oh, so I got to do it after all? Fine. No. Um, <laughs> It's fine. I just have to dig it up. Um, okay. Do I not have it here? It's weird. Okay. 
thought I had it like as a link on the site, but apparently I don't. Um, unless I have it on this page. Ah, I do. Good. So I could reconstruct it, but I'm feeling lazy. I just want to look it up. Um, multi grid. Ah, here we go. Where is it? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll actually write down what this matrix, restriction matrix looks like. Um, so, so R, if it starts in the grid, it says H, 2H. So because it's um, taking in a longer vector and producing a shorter one, that means it's going to have many more columns than rows. It's going to be a re rectangular matrix. Um, and the actual entries are like this. They're one fourth out front. So the idea is um, like if these correspond to x values in the fine grid, okay. Um, what it's doing is, it's um, it's saying that the value at the first grid point comes from a weighted average. So it's taking, so the value is going to be the value of function at the same point with weight one half, but it's also taking the values in the left and right and giving each one a weight of one fourth. All the weights have to add up to one. So, so in other words, um, u one. Okay, actually, u two h element number one is going to be equal to one fourth u h element one plus one half u h element two plus one fourth uh element three. Um, so this linear combination of these three values. Um, this corresponds to the same x value as the middle point, because we're taking every other one. So similarly, the second one would be come from a fine grid point number four, and then its neighbors on the left and right, and so on. So each coarse grid value is a weighted average of nearby fine grid values. So all you have to do is, um, okay, and this has to make the assumption That, uh, that n is odd. Um, now keep in mind for Poisson's equation, your spacing h is 1 over n plus 1 if we're on the interval 0 to 1, like we have been for previous examples. So, so for example, suppose you choose n to be a power of 2 minus 1, so like you know, 1023 then your spacing h is a negative power of 2. And as you go from a finer grid to a coarser grid, those spacings will also be <coughs> negative powers of 2. So everything um, nicely. So, um, so as an example, um, if n is a 1,023, um, that means that R H two H is equal to is a matrix that has a thousand twenty three columns, and then the um, okay so 
Um, and 511 rows, that's a 5, not an S. Um, so notice both the rows and columns are powers of 2 minus 1. Um, well, I guess you wouldn't necessarily notice that unless you've memorized your powers of 2, uh, which hopefully at some point you all will. <laughs> but, um, okay. Well, I guess it comes more natural to computer science students. But, um, okay. Um, so, so I said, like, roughly half as many points in the, in the uh, output. Okay. Um, so the next thing that you do in the multi-grid algorithm, so you just have to form this matrix in your code. As you can see, most of the entries would be zero. So like your uh, matrix A, this matrix should be a sparse matrix. All right, so now once you're operating on the coarser grid, um, then what you do is, We go ahead and solve a problem on the coarser grid. So A2H, um, E2H is equal to R2H. <clears throat> now, um, E here means error. Um, and the reason why I'm referring it to error is the following. Um, if the error is defined to be the exact solution minus the approximate solution, then AE is equal to A times the exact minus A times the approximate. But what is A times the exact solution? No. Wait. What is A times the what? Exact solution. B. B, yes. So B minus AX, which is the what? Yes, there's, yeah. So to match your answer for the right question. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's always a relationship between error and residual in linear systems. A times the error equals the residual. So that's what's happening here. We're taking this coarsen residual, and then we solve this on the coarser grid, and the result of that is our error. But the error is also on the coarser grid. What we need to do is work our way back to the fine grid. So. So the next step is we perform interpolation on the result, on the error. Okay. Um, so error on the fine grid facing H, we take the error from a coarse grid facing 2H, and we multiply that by this matrix I that's called the interpolation operator. So that's, if you ever a bit of multi-grid jargon. Um, okay. And notice that subscript is always a grid you start with, spacing 2H. The superscript is where you end up, spacing H. So unlike the restriction operator, this matrix is going to have many more rows than columns. Um, and the nice thing is that now that I've had a, um, given you what the restriction matrix looks like, it's very easy to describe the interpolation matrix. So the interpolation matrix is just equal to 2 times the restriction matrix transpose. That's it. Um, so, so why would that, um, I actually want to check out the formula there. Uh, 
yeah, I is 2R transpose. Okay, so so why does this work? So first, what it would look like. So these one two ones would be in columns of a one half out front. Um, so, well, something seems odd there about the top of it. Okay. Um, oh, all right. So, so what this means is, for example, you. H um, element one is equal to one half u two h element one, which doesn't make sense right now, but I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Um, u h element two is equal to u two h element one. Now this makes more sense just because. Whatever. Can you point to what element that? Um, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going down the rows over here, and then columns correspond to coarse grid values. Um, so, like for example, this is, comes from a first row. This comes from a second row. But not a specific column. Or well, the reason. Um, this one here is because the entry is in the first column. Okay. So, okay, these superscript entries are rows. Okay. These superscript entries, columns. Because it's the transpose. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next elements, UH3, I really didn't finish explaining that, but let me get this one down first, uh, is equal to U2H. 1 plus u2h2 over 2. Okay, so what's happening here is this x, the x value for this point on the coarse grid is already in the fine grid. So we just copy the value over. Uh, so that's why these rows have 1s, or 2 over 2. Here, this corresponds to an x value that is not in the coarse grid. It's located midway between two coarse grid points. So we take an average of values on the left and right. Um, so what's happening is, if I were to number all the points, find grid up here, coarse grid down here. So this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, and this would be one, two. Um, so for example, at fine grid point number three, that's situated between coarse grid points number one and two. Thus we average them. Um, here we just copy because these points, uh, coarse grid, fine grid, are in the same location. Um, and uh, and you see, every other point is just going to be copied. The ones between those will be averaged. <clears throat> now, with that in mind, though, there's one thing that still seems kind of odd. This one. Here we're taking the location of the value, value function at this point, and we need to get a value over here. And what we're doing is cutting it in half. Why does that make sense? Well, for this particular problem, anyway, Poisson's equation, it does make sense because this is the leftmost interior point, and here's the boundary point. So this would be like point number zero. For problems that work through Poisson's equation, what's the value of the solution at this point? Yeah, 
we, we're using usually boundary conditions. The value here is zero. So whatever value we have over here is heading towards zero, so we should cut it in half at the midway point. So we're just doing linear interpolation between this value and zero. So that's why it makes sense to cut that value in half. So yes, this is a very specialized restriction operator uh, for the examples that we're looking at. Um, OK, so, so now the error that was first obtained from a coarse grid is now mapped to a fine grid. Um, and uh, so then the last step is the solution on the fine grid is updated with this error. We just had to get it back to the same grid on which it was defined in order to do that. Because the solution, u, was never on the coarse grid. Only the residual was. <clears throat> okay. Now, so now the whole procedure has been laid out. And now to explain why Coding this really through the students through for a loop last time. Because at the beginning, you're, you're, you're given you know, this, this matrix, um, and you're given this right-hand side, and now you're solving this problem. So you go ahead and do this um, and get down to this point right here. So this problem is of the exact same form as this problem. It's just on a grid with half as many points and a different right-hand side. Although you could think of this also as a residual, just with the approximate solution being zero. So when you're solving these two problems that are of the exact same form, then here's what you might as well do. If you're writing a function whose job it is to solve this problem on a certain grid, then when you get down to here, you might as well call that same function. In other words, this function that you're implementing, it should call itself with the appropriate matrix on the right-hand side. Now, this matrix, this is your standard Laplacian center difference thingy which you're able to construct for whatever grid size you're given. So that's not a problem. Um, although for some more complicated PDEs, it would be. Um, so when you have a function that calls itself, does anyone know what that's called? Although well, you probably would have only heard it like if you took CS, well, as math majors, you would have taken CSC 101 and might have preferred to block it out of your mind, but um, and who now don't even know if it comes up there. It's called recursion. So um, now recursion is actually a very powerful tool in programming because it gives you a way to uh, really simplify the implementation of a lot of things. Because if you can break down whatever task you have, you're always trying to break it down to subtasks anyway and delegate those to other functions. But sometimes that calls for solving a different version of the same problem you're on. And what's happening in this case is you're solving a smaller version of the same problem. So when you get to this point, you're not re-implementing this. You're just telling it, call this function. And then the output will come back, and now you're here. And you can finish the rest of this. So really all you're doing is you know, you're writing in MATLAB, your MATLAB editor, you know, function uh, u equals multigrid input parameters. And then you do that, that, that. And then call the same function. And then assume that it did its job. You trust that it did its job because you're writing it, right? And, and then you carry out the rest of the steps. Um, and for some reason, that just tends to really weird people out when they're doing it for the first time because they don't realize that they 
um, you have to separate. You still have to separate two instances because internally, under Brooklyn, what's really happening is when MATLAB calls this function for the first time, it stores the data about like its input parameters and local variables and so forth. And then it, it's executing the code and says, oh, I'm going to call the same function. So now it's going to store that data. It's a separate call. It just happens to, happens to go from the same statements, but um, but it's still separate. The, the thing you have to be careful about is if a function is going to keep calling itself, what's the danger of that? If a function is going to carry out a few steps, call itself, and do what the same function is doing. Well, it won't replace it. So MATLAB will keep it separate. Oh, it, it actually maintains it's called a stack. It's called a call stack. So here's the information for first time called, the second time called. Nothing is lost. But if a function is going to do these things and call itself, it's going to do that every single time. What could go wrong? Yes. If you are not careful, it will be an infinite loop. The call stack will be exhausted, and MATLAB will freak out and yell at you. Um, and a terrible thing, huh? Um, but so what you have to do whenever you're implementing recursion is you have to have what's called a limiting case. There has to be some condition in here, like through an if statement, that will cause the recursion to stop. So in other words, this function is not going to call itself every single time. It will in most cases, but you have to have a condition under which it would stop. Um, and I'll give you this very simple example of... Um, I'll write a very short recursive function for something else that'll show you what I mean by limiting case. Okay, so function uh, y is equal to factorial. And the input is n. So you want n factorial. So normally we might think, oh, well, y is equal to n times factorial of n minus 1, because that's how factorial can be defined, recursively. Because uh, if you've, you've got the product of everything from 1 to n minus 1, um, and then you just multiply out n, and you're done. And this will cause an infinite loop. So what should I check for to have it not do this? What will be a case where, I guess for depending on the input n, where I don't have to I don't need to do this recursion. No. So in other words, when is the problem so simple that I don't need to do this? When n is one. Yeah. Um, or I could do this. Like if n, and we're like, okay, we'll make we'll make the assumption that n is at least non-negative because negative integers is a whole other. But if n is less than or equal to 1, let's say, we'll just return 1. Else, that should have been dented, but oh well. Um, else we do that. That's how you properly implement recursion. Make sure it is going to stop. So here, too, you could have this recursion happen unless the problem is so small that you just use backslash and solve it. And that output will bubble up and MATLAB will carry out these steps. So then each call will will, will then end. And it'll go back and, and the, the thing that students have a hard time wrapping their heads around is here you're, you're telling a function to call itself and it comes back with this output, the E2H in this case. And it's going to resume these steps. And the thing is, whatever variables you had, had the values that they had before the call was made. So the, the, the memory of each recursive call is separate. And once you, if I call this function to do all this again, then once it's exited, all that's gone away. The only thing that's left is the output, and you carry on with that output and the previous values that you had. That's how a call stack works. Um, so... Like, if, if this is a data from a first function call, then here comes the second one, and let's suppose the problem's really small in this case, then 
uh, it completes its job, it doesn't call itself again, then the output comes out, this is deallocated, it's completely erased. And now we're back here with the data that was already there when the call was made, and it carries on. Um, so, uh, so hopefully by clicking you guys in about recursion up front, this won't be so nutty when you guys actually get to it. Um, of course, you have a few problems away. So, um, so, so we'll see how this goes. But, but it's important to have trust in the recursive process. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, so what happens is, let's suppose you're on a grid of a great many points, um, and then you implement this multigrid and you solve a problem of half the size, and then half again, half again, half again. So all of that work on all the coarser grids will, a bit, will amount to about the same amount of work as you did on a fine grid. So let's suppose you have two to the 10 grid points. So if you carry this out without coarsening a grid, you'd be doing 10 passes, um, each one taking about the same amount of work. But by coarsening the grid, it only takes twice as many passes. Um, because all of that work added up amounts to the same work as a fine grid. So um, now with 10, that's not a great example. but the same is true if you have you know, two to the hundredth grid points. Uh, then it still um, counts as two passes over that grid, not a hundred. So the savings only increases as the number of grid points increases because you're gaining so much by cutting that grid size in half every time you go down. Okay. Um, now, unfortunately, it looks like even though we have some time left today, um, I will not get through everything. There will have to still be some stuff covered on uh, uh, Monday after Thanksgiving. Um, but for the rest of the time, I want to talk about uh, the other kind of uh, iterative methods, Krelov subspace methods, which don't really relate that much to my Krelov subspace spectral methods. There is a reason that the names have something in common, but the word sp spectral changes things quite a bit. And it took several years for me to realize that it is Krelov, not Krylov. Uh, apparently, a lot of people in the American Lost community still don't know that. <clears throat> okay. Was he like the person? Yes. Okay. No. Um, actually, I think I have a book by him. Um, um, okay. So, um, for a system that is already preconditioned. So new iterate is equal to previous iterate plus a residual. So this is still B minus AX. Okay. Um, so, no, so really it's a system that is perfectly preconditioned. Um, Okay, then it's actually possible to write out a formula for all the iterates. So let's assume for simplicity that the initial guess is zero. So in that case, the first residual will just be B. And this is zero. So the next iterate, X1, would just be B. Um, so now, 
Let's suppose I plug this into here. My new residual is B minus AB. And then I add that onto B. So X2 is B, sorry, 2B minus AB. Um, and then I do this one more time. I substitute this into here. So now I'm going to have like a term involving A squared B. Um, so I won't go from the algebra, but the third iterate would be 3B minus 3AB plus A squared. All right, so um, actually, I think it might be possible to write a nice formula for all of these, because that would be the same as identity minus A squared times B. Um, no. Okay. And now there's still one term that's off. Um, Oh, okay. Is that right? Because oh. Okay. So I have B minus 2AB plus B squared, or sorry, plus A squared B. Okay. Whereas this is A inverse times B minus identity minus A cubed B. So that seems to be the pattern. Um, okay. I'm not sure I can really do anything with that, but okay. Just make it an observation, that's all script. <laughs> um, but the main thing I really want to point out about all these iterates is um, each iterate, xk, belongs to the span of Of this subspace consisting of vectors uh, b, a b, a squared b, and so on, up to a to the k minus one b. So this is a k-dimensional Krelov subspace. So that's what a Krelov subspace is. A Krelov subspace is generated by a vector B and matrix A. You start with a vector and you keep multiplying it by A, um, however many times until you fill out the dimension of a space. So we can also say that xk is equal to a polynomial in A times b. So the Creole subspace consists of all vectors that are equal to a polynomial in A up to degree k minus 1 times b. <clears throat> all right. Um, now, um, now the thing is, this is for a very specialized iteration, but we want to use the same idea for um, iterations in, 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 uh, in general. 
So, um, so the idea is, if we already decide up front that xk is going to belong to this subspace, and it's easy to develop this subspace, because all we're doing is we're taking vectors in the subspace already and multiplying them by a. Um, so, so pre love subspace methods set xk to be an element of this k-dimensional preload subspace um, by some sort of accuracy criteria. And what I mean by that is we try to find a vector limiting ourselves to this preload subspace that is a vector that is closest to the solution of ax equals b in some sense. Um, okay. Now, different methods use different criteria. Okay. Um, but what they all have in common is that from iteration to iteration, They're building, growing a larger and larger, more expansive Krelov subspace. The dimension keeps increasing. Um, by multiplying by A. Um, so each iteration in a Krelov subspace method has a matrix vector product, or maybe two of them. This is why these methods are used for systems where a matrix A is sparse so that that matrix vector multiplication is cheap. So, so generally, it's going to take order n work per iteration. Um, so the goal is we want to try to not carry out so many iterations. Um, but that's a challenge. So here's some criteria that some of these methods use. And then that will give you a chance to mention some of the best known Creole subspace methods. Um, so first method is for conjugate gradients, or the best known real cell space method. Conjugate gradient, or CG. Um, A has to be symmetric positive definite. It's only for those kinds of systems. Um, if it's so popular, it threw a party for its 50th birthday. And it was also my advisor's 70th birthday, so he was included in the party too. Um, okay. So, the criteria that's used is that symmetric positive definite. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Each residual. Yes has to be orthogonal to big K sub little k, which I should have been introduced that notation earlier, that is the Krelov subspace. This Krelov subspace. So I'll just, yes, big K sub little k. So, so the residual must be orthogonal to every vector in the Krelov subspace. And the thing is, the Krelov subspace is always growing from iteration to iteration. So that means that the residual has to be diminishing because it's being orthogonal to more and more vectors in your entire space. If you kept going all the way to the dimension of the whole space, you know, n, um, then the residual would have to be zero because it's going to be orthogonal to everything. But you don't really want it to go that far. Your matrix, this is a case where n is really large. You don't have to take n iterations. You'd like to 
stopped long before that. Okay. Um, so that's one method. Another method, or two methods that go together, um, gmres and minres. Uh, minres is short for minimum residual method, and gmres is generalized minimum residual method. Minres requires A to be symmetric, um, whereas GMRES does not. Um, but it, 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 really, MinRes, you can think of as a special case of GMRES. Um, and the goal here is to minimize the norm of the residual, the two norm. Um, so in other words, the idea is to choose your iterant xk so that the residual is as small as possible. Now, if your residual is small, there's a good chance that your error is small too. That is not a guarantee, uh, especially when A is ill-conditioned. But it's a criterion that can be implemented uh, without too much difficulty. Um, Another method that's closely related to conjugate gradient is biconjugate gradient. So by CG. So really it's just an effort to generalize conjugate gradient to non-symmetric uh, systems. Um, I can't really say it's worked all that well, but um, people have tried really hard. Um, here, the residual must be orthogonal to the Krylov subspace, but not of A, A transpose. Um, That's not the same notation we used earlier. Like, the one thing we used was that we used earlier. Like, the, before with the conjugate gradient, Krylov subspace of what? Uh, well, of, of A. By, by default, it would be A. Okay. Um, but we don't have to like put in. Um, no. Okay. So it's just a trade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then one other method, uh, SimLQ, which is actually was developed by my friend at Stanford, Michael Saunders. Um, well, I guess he's my academic brother because Gene was both our advisor. Um, this is for symmetric systems also. And it's actually able to minimize the norm of the error over a Krylov subspace. So it's finding the one iterate from that Krylov subspace that makes the error as small as possible, which is definitely nicer than a residual. That's choosing an x-case so your error is as small as possible. What? You said choose an x-case. Yes. Um, yes. So all of these methods. They're choosing an iterate xk from the newly grown Krylov subspace. Um, and it's trying to update the previous iterate in such a way as to satisfy this cri whatever criteria it has. Okay. And all of these are viable criteria in terms of that eventually the system will be solved. Eventually the error will be driven to zero. Uh, but some criteria are easy, easier to enforce uh, than others. Okay. Um, okay, 10 minutes, but I only have a portion of a page left. Okay. Um, what? All right. Um, now, um, another property of conjugate gradient um, is that the, uh, really it's an outgrowth of this, because each uh, residual is orthogonal to the uh, corresponding Krylov subspace, all residuals are
are orthogonal to each other. Um, this is important because for another method, which I haven't listed here, called method of steepest descent, um, its goal is to minimize a certain function of a solution that would be equal to zero when you have the exact solution. And it uses a residual as a direction to go from one iterative to the next. And in steepest descent, each residual is orthogonal to the previous residual, but not the ones before that. So which leads to a steepest descent method kind of zigzagging. Um, so in other words, each, each new direction is not independent of all previous directions. It's covering old ground. Concrete gradient doesn't do that. By ensuring that each residuals are orthogonal to all other residuals, um, then the method's able to cover new ground in every iteration to try to get closer to the solution. So it's much more effective uh, that way. Okay. Now, um, Okay, so the last things I want to say are about specifically conjugate gradient, which is a method of greatest interest to us because it's for symmetric positive definite systems, and when you're solving Poisson's equation, that matrix is symmetric positive definite for um, minus Laplacian. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, Contrary gradient specifically, or CG. Uh, I'm going to let delta R I be the difference in consecutive residuals. And I'm going to let delta X I be the difference in consecutive iterates for the solution. Now, um, okay. I hate when I have something in my notes. It's like, why is that true? And something like two years ago, it's like, oh yeah, I bet I forgot. So, all right, bad preparation on my part, <laughs> or maybe my notes are deficient. So one thing I can say is that delta x i is a member of this Prelog subspace of the uh, same dimension i, because so really this vector is in the Prelog subspace of dimension i minus one. This is the Prelog subspace of dimension i. But this Krill subspace is contained within this one. So, so both of these vectors are really in Krill subspace dimension i, so the difference must be also. Okay, now, um, okay, each residual is in k i plus 1. Uh, so residual size is in field subspace i plus 1. This is in k i. Um, that's because each residual is intended to be orthogonal to, um, to the entire field subspace of dimension um, i. Um, now, So what I have here in my notes, and I'm like, huh, is um, this difference of residuals is in ki minus 1. Um, OK. So Now the thing is, this res each residual 
is orthogonal. Oh, never mind. I misread my notes. Okay. So each residual is okay, orthogonal. Is it belong? Is it, Yes, it's Monday. Deal with it. <laughs> okay. All right. So these statements are not helping me. These statements will. This is orthogonal to ki. This is orthogonal to ki minus one. Um, but ki contains ki minus one. So this is orthogonal to ki minus one also. Therefore, their difference is orthogonal to ki minus one. Now I was reading my notes like, oh, it's an element of this space. It's like, no, that's not possible. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, so because this vector belongs to this field of subspace, and this vector is orthogonal to this field of subspace, then I have the following. So I put these two statements together that delta x i transpose delta x delta r k is equal to zero whenever i is less than k. Um, because this is belonging to k i, this is orthogonal to ki, because it's orthogonal to ki minus 1 and every space contained within it, so with a lesser index. Um, so, so that dot product has to be 0. Oh, God, I have two minutes left. Okay. Um, but what we have here, but the thing is, um, Delta RK, which is defined as B minus AXK minus B minus AXK minus 1, the B's cancel. And then I can factor an A out of everything else. So this is equal to minus A. Minus. Okay. <clears throat> okay. X K. A G X K. A delta. are 
A or father. Okay, they're not orthogonal. So I'll make the distinction very clear here. This is orthogonal. Vector transpose other vector is zero. Stick an A in the middle of that. That's A orthogonal. It's another measure of orthogonality. Think of it as an alternative inner product, which you can do as a valid inner product for any symmetric positive definite matrix that you put in here. Um, so these vectors, they're not perpendicular. They are linearly independent, which is good. Um, so having switch directions being truly orthogonal is not easy to accomplish. Um, but this is a... We're settling for this. That's what conjugate gradient does. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, so this is how conjugate gradient is set up. Each iterate is equal to the previous iterate plus some multiple of the uh, search directions. And how do we choose the constant? The constants are chosen to maintain um, orthogonality of residuals, so that is regular orthogonality, and A orthogonality of the search directions. Okay. Um, and the thing is, I know I've gone a little past, but I swear to God I'm done shortly. Um, steepest descent used search direction equal to residual. That doesn't work because of the zigzagging. So what conjugate gradient does is it sets each search direction equal to a combination of residual and the previous search direction, again, to maintain these criteria. And that's what fixes steepest descent to give you conjugate gradient. Um, Okay, so the last point I'll make is that conjugate gradient, um, what it does is it finds a minimum, minimum of this function, which I'll call e of x is one half x transpose a x minus x transpose b. Um, because um, this function, if you take its gradient and set it equals 0, it's 0 when ax equals b. So gradient b equals 0 if and only if ax equals b. The Hessian is a, which is symmetric positive definite, which means it's a minimum. Um, so steepest and standard conjugate gradient both work with this function. Um, there's a kind of gradient has a way of arriving at the minimum more efficiently by making sure that the search directions stay independent of one another. Okay, so, um, so that's your crash course in methods. So uh, Wednesday we'll talk about homework. Um, so hopefully some progress can be made there. Next week is off. Following Monday I will cover VLAST stuff on time-dependent PDEs. Wednesday, homework slash talk about oral final. Um, and that won't be at the end. <laughs> Sorry for running over. <laughs>